So you just look at these everyday objects and see them in a different light. And then you start to see the beauty in things we take for granted because there's so much beauty around us. But when you see every day, you normalize it. Hey there, Beyond the Palette podcast listeners. I'm so happy you are joining us here today. I'm your host, Whitney Rosenson, the president and owner of Art Dimensions, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with an awesome and just a very prolific painter today, Gus Harper. Hi, Gus. Hey, Whitney. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm happy. I'm here in my studio having a good day. Oh, nice. Welcome to the Art Dimensions podcast. Thank you so much for being here uh, and for taking the time to chat with me and welcoming us into your creative world. Something I've been very curious about, and I know our listeners are curious about, what made you want to be an artist? Ooh, I think um, that's a good surprise question. I think that we all are artists when we're little kids. And the question is, what makes people stop being an artist? Uh, right. So I was an artist when I was a little kid. You know, like you ask any like five-year-old, are you a good artist? They're like, oh yeah, I'm a great artist. They're so confident. And then maybe they get inhibitions start being thrust upon them. Like they, they're told they can't be an artist or they're not good or something happens. Um, my mom is an artist. Right. So I always had that like as a possibility in my life. And when I was a little kid, if you asked me, like, what are you going to be when you grow up? I would have said, you know, one day I'm going to be an astronaut, a fireman, an artist, and an NFL football player. Like you have all those things. And as you get older and you mature, some of the things fall away and some take shape and the artist thing just took shape over the years just more and more I just I always uh, loved being an artist I thought you'd be I think because my mom is an artist I thought that that's a possibility you can be an artist that's an that's an okay adult thing to be so she inspired you yeah absolutely and I think it's like the for me it's like the, it was my first choice thing I could be I thought you know I'm just gonna I'm gonna shoot for my dream and it worked out so great. How long have you been painting? Like all my life in a way. I mean, I was just like the kid who was good in art class in elementary school and through high school. Um, I sold my first painting when I was 17 years old for a hundred dollars. Oh, wow. Yeah, I actually, it's it actually a little bit of a fun story. So I used to run track and field and I had drawn a picture, a, a black and white drawing of the American record holder in the 800 meter run, which was the event I ran. And I just happened to be at a track where he was working out when I was in high school, I saw him and I called my dad and I said, Hey dad, when you come pick me up from practice, could you bring that drawing of Johnny Gray down? And so he brought it down and I went up to Johnny Gray and asked him, excuse me, sir, hey, could you autograph my drawing? He said, sure kid. And he took a look at it. He's like, Whoa, this is amazing. Could, could you draw me one? I'll pay you. I'll pay you for it. And I was 17 and he was my hero. I said, draw you one. I'll paint you one. So my hero gave me his phone number. Then I went home. I was like, damn, I got to figure out how to paint it now. <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was doing, uh, but that was my first sale. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So who are some of your greatest influences besides your mom? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. That's a, that's a, that's hard. Um, a lot of the people who influence me, I don't paint like them, but they influence me as like, they inspire me. Recently, like I'm really inspired by just street art. That's what I look at and see the most. Um, I really love the work of Francesco Clemente. It's one of my all-time favorites. Then, you know, I get inspired by musicians and other things that kind of, uh, and authors. I get inspired by, I get inspired by music and literature quite a bit. So it's kind of funny. You would think I'd, you want something a little bit more on the nose, but like sometimes that's what kind of goes, comes into me. That's the input that influences my output. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's, a, those can be great influences. I know philanthropy is important to you. So can you tell us which charities you are working with now and about your popular Gemscape installation? Oh, sure. So that was uh, interesting how that came about. It's really just me in my studio thinking about what I can do to be helpful because I'm, you know, I was really grateful that during the last year, which has been a rough year for a lot of people, I'm like, you know, things have actually gone pretty well for me. Um, that's great. Like, but there's a lot of people, like, there's a lot of negativity out there. And I thought, how can I, how can I be, how can I help out a little bit? And I had been painting these gem paintings and I really got into them. And I started making these like little cutouts that I was placing all around outside, like in, in the mountains of Malibu and Santa Barbara uh, for photo shoots. 
And that slowly turned into a street art thing where I was gonna put them all throughout the city. I'm like, this is a perfect, this is a perfect opportunity right here um, for me to do a little philanthropy. And I started working for two charities. One was the Pilot Light Foundation, which helps uh, people uh, kind of like suffering from abject poverty, helps them raise their quality of living. And that's a friend of mine named Carol Levy runs that. So I thought I'm gonna help out them. And then also to be more local, I'm gonna help out the Boys and Girls Club of Santa Monica when I was a little kid and I love that place. So anyways, I started putting these gems all throughout the city. Um, How many did you put out? I put out maybe 60, and I think I should show you one. And I mean, I put them from Santa Barbara to Pasadena to Echo Park, Monterey Park, East LA, Redondo Beach. So would you hide these or would you? I, I did a little bit, but I thought, you know, they, I want them to be found. So I put them kind of conspicuous and they'd be just sitting out where somebody could see them and they had a little note sticking up. And the note would say, congratulations, you found me, you can keep me. And then you, op- and then you open up the note, inside, there's always like a little bit of money, maybe oh like a $2 bill to a 20, one had a hundred bucks in it. And it says, if you're in need, please keep this. And Aww. if you're feeling grateful, please feel free to pay it forward. And then there's a link to the Pilot Light Foundation, which is pilotlight-org.org. And then there's another link to the Boys and Girls Club. And so some people who found them actually did pay it forward. They kept every piece of the gym. Some people actually contributed and gave money. To those organizations. So that was kind of fun. And it just came, gave me, you know, it kept me creative. It was like really good for me too. It kept me, gave me something to do. And uh, not that I lack things to do, but it just kind of fueled my own energy. And right. Just had a lot of positivity of what was going on. I'm really into these paintings and, you know, I think they go well in my studio with what I've got going on. So yeah, they I'm are enjoying beautiful. having them around. So the Gemscape installation, is that still happening now or have all 60 been found? So no, they've all been found. And so yeah, I've, actually sometimes I'll stash them. I'll go across the street and watch, wait and watch until somebody like, goes by and they pick it up and look at it and they take it off, take off with it. And it feels kind of good to see them get all happy. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to do, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it in Colorado. Oh, great. Yeah, it's going to be in Boulder, in the Boulder, Denver area. And then there are talks of me doing it in other cities, oddly like Salt Lake City. So each time I do it, I'm going to link up with a local charity to do it. Oh, fantastic. I read in a in the Santa Monica Daily Press, I read about your Gemscape installation. And I read one piece was like a knight, like from a chess game. Right. Uh, that had some significance to you and can you explain about the knight piece to us yeah if so for for those of us who play chess the the knight which is the horse it's the only one that goes forward to and then over one so it it's you know it's an indirect path so it represents symbolically that represents getting to your destination via indirect route which is important to a lot of people because sometimes like we make a plan in life and we don't doesn't life doesn't always follow that plan very true yeah. And then also it's the only piece I believe that can jump over other pieces. So it represents overcoming barriers with ease. Oh, overcoming your obstacles. Yeah. Overcoming obstacles. Yeah. Kind of like Ganesh has that symbolism too, I think for a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people look at the last year as a, as a not, bit of an obstacle, but this is like, reminder you can overcome it. Definitely. Oh, it's so positive. That's so great. What keeps you motivated to keep painting? You have bodies of work, you have installations, you have murals, which we'll talk about in a minute. You have collaborations with other artists. What motivates you to keep painting? I think that it's kind of a little bit of a snowball effect. I spend so much time working on, and the whole time I'm working, I'm getting like I'm daydreaming usually by myself. So all those daydreams is just time for me to come up with new ideas. And I think, oh, you know, I could tweak this painting a little differently and have a different effect, but you know what? I want to keep this, my original idea. I'll do that for the next one. And then I'd make another one and another one and just, just that, then also I have a body of work where each one's a little bit different, but the last one may be wildly different than the first one. That's kind of where the seed starts to grow a little bit. And then I get such nice feedback from people, like the affirmations, friends or people who are buying paintings. I just, uh, I think being outdoors, I've been doing a lot of paintings outdoors lately, like installations, especially. And so that gives me a chance to interact with other people. And I just, the ideas start flowing in and I don't know, I think I'm just pretty fired up right now. And I figured, you know, I might as well strike while the iron's hot. I mean, as far as like being emotionally prepared to paint. Sometimes an artist isn't always uh, inspired and I'm, I am inspired right now. So I'm running with it. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. How do you deal with rejection? I mean, you probably don't get a lot of rejection, but let's say you're applying to a show or a contest. How do you deal with rejection? I think that because you're such a motivated, positive person, and I think that you could really help a lot of people. I've never been rejected. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, uh, that's that's funny. Well, I don't. Um, if uh, it's a tricky question, it's, it's a it's a funny question. I I don't know if it's actually something I face as much these days, but maybe because I'm not putting myself in position for that. Like one of I have a couple of younger assistants, and like maybe a young man who's working for me, he's talking about a girl he wants to date, and you could get rejected, and people take that personally. Like think about this on a romantic level, right? They get rejected. I'm like, no, that person just realized before you did that the two of you are not a fit. So you know, like it's not it's just not a rejection. It's just a. Uh, I understand. I understand that. Yeah, and I mean, gosh, yeah. By the way, I always recommend the book, The Four Agreements. Because, you know, the first agreement is like, don't take th- things personally. And, right. You know, a lot of times if you're a young artist and I don't, I don't really do this anymore, but I used to like apply for a show or something. You're applying, you're sending your images in along with a thousand other people who are applying to get some, some show and somebody you've never met before is looking at them. They might be looking at your stuff for like a second. There's no- Ah, what advice would you give to your younger self? I think one thing that I follow pretty well, but I would advise myself to do it even more would be- just only paint what you want to paint. I don't like how do you to avoid even like be very careful with commissions. You know, I love when somebody says, Oh, I love this painting. Could you make me a, a bigger one or a smaller one? Sure. Luckily, I've been in a position where people haven't asked me to do what like they don't look at this and say, Hey, that's cool. Can you portrait paint a portrait of my dog? <laughs> Luckily, that hasn't really happened to me. Right. But I do see sometimes artists like, ah, oh, I need the money and I gotta do it. And you know, I've had people ask me to do things I didn't want to do. And I, ha- I have said no, but sometimes you let, you just, when people ask, they put a little input in and like, oh, it's just inside my comfort level. Okay. I'll let you weigh in a little bit. And then they push a little bit more. All of a sudden it's like not comfortable anymore because no longer your art, the audience will notice. It'll, it'll look compromised. You'll notice the art won't be about, it won't be true anymore. That's great advice. That's I mean, great advice. I might give somebody else. I don't know if I give that to my younger self. Cause like I said, I've been. But that's great advice for a new artist or you know, even a seasoned artist. Yeah, it's a remind. It's something I need to remind myself of all the time. Actually, another thing, this is something that I've learned over the years and I still need to remind myself is like, don't get frustrated when your painting isn't working because it just means it's not done yet. Sometimes I can be, I can be like, it can be tenderly like, ah, let it be rec- let it be whatever it is because that's what's coming out of you of, from that day. And then therefore it's true. So you, you may be let go of expectation a little bit. And just be authentic. Yeah, most most artists are, are pretty authentic, but sometimes, you know, you can have somebody come in who, out of enthusiasm, not out of a bad space, it's out of joy, they might want to weigh in and tell you what to paint a little bit because they're thinking, um, if I was an artist, I would want to paint this. I'm like, yeah, but you're talking to an artist who he or she may not want to do that. You should respect the artist and- Respect their process. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk about your murals because they are so incredible. You've created a bunch of murals. There's one in Malaysia. There's one in Chiang Mai, Thailand. There's one in Santa Barbara, in Malibu. Where else can people find your murals locally? There's in Santa Monica. There's one on 34th and Pico. Um, I just recently painted some barricades on Main Street. Okay. I just did one in Ventura last week, a pretty big one on Main Street and Telegraph. Oh, great. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a giant one, a 600 foot long one in Malibu on Malibu Canyon. How long are these murals? How large are they? And how long does it take you to complete them? Oh, so some are so small that they would just be like street art. Like I painted a skull on the side of a wall in Kathmandu. That took me like two hours. Um, then there's one that took me six weeks. It just depends on the scale. The one I just worked on in Ventura, I did in two parts. So I did a side wall that took me three days. And then I did a longer adjacent wall that took me a solid week. I, I think I'm going to do one this next week that was going to take me two days, probably. I you know, never really know because sometimes I might make a change. I, I treat my murals like canvases. Like I don't, I think a lot of professional muralists will go in with an outline and just kind of fill it in. It's, it's very st- st- scientific. It's mapped out. I treat mine like a canvas. I, I go by feel. So I'll paint over here. Then I'll move over here. Then I'll go over here. And then based on what came out here, I'm like, oh, 
over here never no longer looks good anymore and I'll make a change and that so I'll paint over things until it all works out. You know, you might start with a plan, but once it comes into reality, you think, you know what, I'm going to make an adjustment. So I don't always know how long it's going to take. That's so cool. So it's more of a spontaneous process for you. Yeah, it can be. And actually, you know, what has been cool too, is I've had a couple of people have hired me and they said, yeah, I'm going to hire you to paint this wall. And I'm, I'm like, great, I'll start, I'm going to start tomorrow. And somebody will come up to me and say, oh, what are you painting? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, I just start, <laughs> I just start painting. Um, I'm like, I was in uh, Sri Lanka and I did a mural there and I, I spent, it was really hard for me to get permission to do this mural at a train station. I finally got permission and I was so relieved. I'm like, oh, I guess I better go with some paint now. And while I'm at it, I better think about what am I going to paint? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and then there was a crowd of people watching behind me. I'm like, that's a little bit of pressure. So I formulated the plan quickly and I went with it. And what did it, what was the end result? What was that mural of? It was like actually much more of a very sp uh, spiritual painting. It had a big lotus and a, and a woman's face and all this like. Oh, neat. Yeah. That sounds it, absolutely exquisite. It was fun. And actually there, was, there, there were like so many people watching and I would say, hey, uh, do you, do you want to help out? And I get people like a little place and they start to work and then they got really into it. And it was great because I didn't plan when I went to Sri Lanka, I'm like, all of a sudden just came in. I'm like, I want to go to Sri Lanka like tomorrow. And I did. <laughs> and I got there. I'm like, I don't know anybody here. I didn't do any research. Like I just arrived here. And so it's kind of like a little, and I thought, I don't know what to do. Um, what's the most carpe diem thing I could do? So I was like, you know, I'm going to paint a mural. That's how that came into my head. But like I said, I didn't know anybody. Well, after I finished the mural, I knew so many people. I had so many invites for dinner and places to go. And, oh, nice. Uh, and also invites to come mural inside people's homes. Everyone wanted to mural. I'm like, okay, I gotta, I'm only here for a limited time. But oh, That's wonderful. Tell us about your different bodies of work. You've got the Sojourner's Journey. Yeah, the Sojourner's, that, because that came out of like, I was traveling the world so much. So I, I literally was a sojourner, but we all are like spiritual travelers. So yeah, that's kind of a recent body of work. And what are the other bodies of work? Uh, I think the first one was the signs of a, of a benevolent universe, ordinary everyday objects, showing them in a different light by maybe even exaggerating or simplifying the details. Like it could be something like one one that was more popular was the citrus series. So it could be like an orange slice, like super close up. And, but you get so close that it starts to look like lava or mountains. So you just look at these everyday objects and see them in a different light. And then you start to see the beauty and things we take for granted because there's so much beauty around us. But when you see every day, you normalize it. People tend to overlook things. Yeah, which is interesting because like I'm talking about like literal objects, but you can start to do that with people even. You take for granted the, you know, a lovely person in your life or gratitude for like the amazing stuff we have. Yep. So that was a good one. Um, I did another, another body work called Minor Identity Crisis. <laughs> and that one was funny because some people like somebody asked my mom like is your son okay like I'm like no it's not that I'm having I'm personally having an identity crisis it's just that it makes us question everything and this was like a couple of years ago before things I think things is even more so now it when you have all this information come in it makes you question entire paradigms and when you do so there becomes an unknown sometimes unknowns bring about fear and so this was about finding the tools to overcome fear and become the best person we can be Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's something I think about, but at the same time, I'm still making paintings, so I'm still trying to make a cool painting. You know, I still want to look good. It's, <laughs> it's not just about the concept. Of course. Well, but it's both. It's, it's both. Yeah, then that's like the, I don't stick, I don't, I don't confine myself to any kind of like theme or visual. Like if I, like sometimes I'll just like take a left turn and I'm like, oh, look what's coming out of this. It's this whole new body of work. And that's, that is what happens. Like I started to make a bunch of, the paintings started getting darker and darker. All of a sudden I had a show of all black paintings. Not black as in any way dark. They're still very celebratory. So now what's the message behind your paintings? I mean, I know you try to paint your messages about celebration and positivity and hope. How else sometimes. would you? Sometimes. Sometimes? Um, you know, sometimes like uh, maybe there's like a sense of wonder that accidentally maybe gets infused into my work but not everything is positive. Not all my thoughts are positive. You know, I collaborate with another artist a lot and he saw me, I learned a lesson. This is from my friend Gronk. So Gronk is a well-known artist and I, we collaborate quite a bit and I learned a really good lesson. He reminded me of something. And that is he saw me um, hesitate and he says, ah, stop thinking. 
just paint. And so I asked him about that later. I'm like, you're right. Cause I know when we think the mind gets, the mind can get in the way. Yeah. So it's so like, we're men of the mind. Like we think we're not just like, Oh, whatever, whatever comes out of me. We're not our rule about it. We use our mind. And I, and I said, but when it's time to paint, you tell me, don't think, just paint, let it come out of you. And I know that's right, but I can't reconcile those two ideas. Can you help me out with that? Can you articulate it for me? And he gave me this little gem. He said, you know, you use your mind when you read the books, when you have the in-depth conversations, when you see the movies, you see the art, that's the mind that you, you take it in. That's when you use your mind. Then when you're on the output, then you just let it come out. Like You take it in and you digest it. What comes out. So, you know, what comes out could be positive, could be negative. Um, but a lot of times I just get an idea for something that will look cool. Like making a giant airplane, it was more like, was there some deep thought behind that? I'm like, or is it just kind of along the lines of, you know what, that'd be so badass to make a giant paper airplane. And what did you do with that giant paper airplane? I chucked it off the mountain. Very nice. So that was actually came out of the gym project. Because I had, I somehow some of my gems started to look like airplanes. I painted some airplanes. So then I made a, a cutout of a paper airplane. I made a giant one, like a giant wood cutout. I'm like, for, as a kind of a prop. But then I thought, well, why don't I make it three dimensional? It's eight foot long. Oh, wow. Because I threw it off a cliff and it flew a long way and eventually, you know, nose dived in. What is your Instagram or your, what, tell everyone your Instagram or website address. Um, they're the same. So my website is gusharperart.com and my Instagram is at gusharperart. And that's where people can see the video of the paper airplane and the gemscapes. And and there's, uh, by, by popular request, there's going to be a third paper airplane made. And I'm launching that one probably up in Santa Barbara first. And there's going to be a lot of little kids that are going to come up and watch me throw up the mountain park. And we never know, because sometimes it just goes. Sometimes it just goes straight. <laughs> you want it to soar. I hope it soars. With, it usually usually get one or two good flights out of it. Depends on the wind. And when are you launching that one? Uh, I'll probably do it in a couple of weeks. Very cool. Gus, this was so much fun. I really appreciate you talking with me and giving us all a glimpse into your creative process. If uh, anyone listening has questions about Gus's work, you can email me through the Art Dimensions website, which is artdimensionsonline.com. And be sure to check out his awesome paintings on the site as well. And also be sure to follow us and Gus on Instagram at Art Dimensions and at Gus Harper Art. Happy creating. Thanks, Gus. Thanks, Gus.